In my capacity, it is my duty and privilege to welcome people who come to our campus. And that's my happy privilege this morning to extend a cordial welcome to the special guests, to the participants, and to everyone who has come to join us for any or all of the sessions of this, the fourth in a series of our centennial symposia, the first in this centennial year. And so I want to welcome you warmly this morning in the hope that you will find it possible to come back, not only in succeeding instances, but also during the rest of the day. I guess this is the task of an official greeter, to make people so welcome that they will want to come back. It reminds me of the woman who was being interviewed for a job as a domestic servant, and the, the lady said, are you able to welcome people properly? And she said, yes, both ways. And the lady said, what do you mean, both ways? She said, so as they come back and so as they won't. <laughs> well, I would like to welcome you so that you will feel it worthwhile to take in all of the sessions today and also to join us for other events which take place during this centennial year here at Augsburg College. But we're particularly happy that you have come to join us for this session and for what we believe is to be a very important discussion on an exceedingly significant topic. Now let me take off my working hat and put on what I call my good neighbor hat. And I want this morning to be as neighborly as our good neighbor to the great Northwest, WCCO Radio. For WCCO Radio is a co-sponsor of this symposium on the problems of, eco uh, of ecology. In its desire to be of public service, WCCO Radio has linked to the private colleges of Minnesota in a series of symposia. This is the second in the series sponsored by WCCO. The first began last year at Gustavus Adolphus, if you will forgive the expression. And that very successful gathering focused on the River Bend area, which is a six county area along the Minnesota River. Because of the stimulus of that particular conference, a River Bend Association was formed, including the public and the private sectors, so that genuine development could take place, significant development could take place in this six county area. And hopefully such uh, concrete results will come out of these symposia. And perhaps one way in which we can help things to happen, and here I digress for a moment, is to cooperate with the survey forms which you have been handed by some people who are engaged in a project. They are with the Department of Anthropology at the University of Minnesota in the study of movement dynamics, whatever that may mean, but I guess it relates to what we're doing. And you are asked to fill this questionnaire out and leave it either in the college center or as you leave this building in the outer lobby. But your cooperation is requested in order that something significant may be done to get action started, some movement, if you please, in the direction of answers to the questions which are raised today. But back again, let me express on behalf of WCCO Radio a welcome to you, and let me on your behalf express our appreciation to WCCO Radio, not only for making this possible because it is their munificence that has made this assemblage today possible, but also for the kind of publicity which they have given to it. And I would like to have you give a good round of applause to the Director of Publicity and Public Relations, Mr. Gordon Mickelson. Where are you, Gordon? Stand up. I should know that he'd be over by the hardware over there in the corner. Now, let me take off that hat and put on very briefly my third hat. It's a kind of a special go-to-meeting hat which I wear 
for the honor of presiding this year as the president of the Minnesota Private College Council. The Minnesota Private College Council with WCCO Radio and Augsburg College co-sponsor this particular event. WCCO went to the Private College Council in order that there could be one uh, office that would coordinate the succession of these symposia. And last year's symposia at Gustavus, this year's at uh, Augsburg, and next year at Carleton College are all arranged in cooperation with the Minnesota Private uh, College Council. I wonder if the executive director of the Private College Council is here, uh, Dr. Edgar Carlson. Is Dr. Carlson here? If you are, will you stand up? There you are. Welcome, Dr. Carlson. So on behalf of the council, I want to welcome you, and also on behalf of the council, thank WCCO Radio and those at Augsburg College who have worked on this symposium. Now back to my working hat. As one who presides, it's my privilege to present this morning uh, our first featured speaker. I hesitate in this introduction because I was exposed last night uh, to uh, the charming Scottish wit uh, of our speaker, and I'm afraid that... Uh, uh, of what might happen uh, as a result of what I might say. But uh, you will listen this morning, I know, to a professor of note, for he is the chairman of the Department of Landscape Architecture and Regional Planning at the University of Pennsylvania. He is a speaker of renown, a writer of stature, a practicing landscape architect and regional planner much in demand, and a TV figure with great charm, and you will be exposed to that in a moment. It's very, uh, a very great pleasure this morning to present to you Professor Eon McCard, whose topic is, What is Man Doing to the Earth and to Himself? The Dimensions of the Ecologic Crisis. When I saw that topic, I thought of the sermon topic that a particular preacher announced on his bulletin board one day, What on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? And I believe that the reverse is just as fundamental. What in heaven's name are you doing for earth's sake? And I'm sure to provoke us to thought along that line, we will listen intently to this address by Professor E. M. McCard. Professor McCard. Thank you, Mr. President. I, should, I suppose I should say I'm honored to be here. I'm nothing of a sort. I'm terrified. If anybody has the illusion I speak to audiences of this size daily, they're entirely wrong. Uh, my impression of the situation is perfectly easily represented in a story which uh, my wife tells. My wife is a Dutch woman, and she had an uncle who was really quite rich, and he was a widower, and he had two prospects of remarriage. One was a friend of his wife who was really rather uh, homely, I think is the American euphemism, and uh, the other, but she had a beautiful voice. And the other was uh, rather like uh, Zsa, Zsa Gabor. And the man cogitated because he felt he could choose freely as between these two creatures. And with some sad reluctance, he finally concluded in favor of his friends, or his wife's, his late wife's homely friend with a beautiful voice. And indeed, they were married. And he woke up in the morning of his first wedding day and he saw lying beside him this recumbent, slightly snoring warthog, and he was overcome with a profound remorse, and he grabbed her by the shoulders and shook her and said, Sing, woman, sing. <laughs> well, that's my problem, you see. I can't sing either. Well, the, study, the subject is a really horrifying one, and... Uh, there have got to be some interjections in humor because men will laugh before death and the subject we're contemplating is almost as serious. I have over the years uh, collected a few stories which I use absolutely mercilessly. If anybody can tell me better ones, I'll use them just as mercilessly. But uh, uh, confronting as I do each year about 20 new anthropocentric students secure in their own arrogance and uh, determined to conquer the earth, I find I have to... Uh, ingratiate my own uh, attitudes and uh, prejudices to them. And so I use these stories. The first one was a very simple one. It was derived from uh, Lauren, Isle uh, Lauren Isley, whom you may know, uh, the great cultural anthropologist at the University of Pennsylvania, 
a man wise and rotund, and he tells a story much more powerfully than I can. But the story simply is that man is now empowered to leave the earth and go into space, as we do quite regularly. And this man in space is allowed to, then to see the earth, and he perceives it to be a whirling orb. Uh, he, he looks closely at the whirling orb and perceives it to be green, green from the maritime algae in the oceans, green from the verdure on the land. He perceives the earth as a great green celestial fruit. And as he looks closely at this earth, he sees upon it some blemishes upon the world uh, epidermis, uh, brown, black, and gray, and from these extend dynamic tentacles. And he sees, of course, that the blemishes upon the world epidermis are the works of man and the cities of man, and asks, is man but a planetary disease? And I think this is a question we all have to ask ourselves. It's very clear that some of us are and some of us are not. And as far as I'm concerned, the fundamental division in the world today is not between communists and non-communists, capitalists, Democrats. Uh, the real fundamental division in the world is the division between those who are planetary diseases and those who are not. Those who have made a way of life of uh, inflicting lesions upon the world body and impoverishing it and ourselves, and those who do believe that they are husbandmen who must contribute to the nurture uh, of the earth. But we can take this position from far out in space to look at the earth to contemplate some of our works. And I'll now put on my spectacles so I can see my notes. And what we see, of course, is not uh, terribly reassuring. We suddenly discover man as... Uh, <laughs> thank you for your solicitude. <laughs> I've got to be hypnotized to stop smoking, and I'm ashamed about it, but... For a moment, I'll do it. I don't think anybody's going to stop me, right? <laughs> I'm in a state of stress, anyway. Uh, we see, of course, this uh, puny figure, man who is now the agent of, uh, who can be the agent of the atomic uh, holocaust, who can extinguish all life. We see that man who can be the single agent of evolutionary regression, we can see that uh, atomic wastes rest in the continental shelf, that DDT exists in the ocean deeps and in the Arctic ice. Indeed, no place can, uh, can one find substances free of DDT. We know that the great forests have gone, that great realms of life have been extirpated, and we know that the soils are thinner now, and we might as well accept that agriculture is just another kind of mining. The Huron, Mississippi, each year is engorged with five cubic miles of topsoil, a wanton prodigality in a, starving, in a starving world. And we can look, of course, from this vantage point at the uh, great wens of cities and metropol metrop metropolis, which are becoming uh, megalopolis, which are well on the way to becoming necropolis. This, you, of course, know as a cemetery. And as we see these blemishes, uh, which uh, surround the continent, necklaces of dead tissue coalescing around the continental edge. We can look <coughs> and see uh, Manhattan, where the, mid the Cornell Medical School study of mid uh, midtown Manhattan showed that 20% of the sample population were indistinguishable from patients in mental hospitals. And another 60% had clear evidence of mental incapacity. We can see the dirty skits of poverty around the gleaming towers and uh, decide that this is a place where rancor and hate and race and fear uh, live. This may very well be the, the home of stress pathology, the behavioral sink, the home of anomie, the place where Kitty Genovese uh, lived and died. If you look to the city, any city, and see the river that made the city, you can see it scummy and brown, the sewage endlessly bobbing up, uh, moving up and down with the tide, endlessly renewed. If uh, you, can, you can see the refineries, one sees the refineries always between the airport and the city, see their cynical spume, know that they may refine, but that they are not indeed refined. Look at the industries which power the cities, see their cynical spume, remember that their uh, products are household words, but observe that they are not housebroken. See the faceless towers, the corporate images, the Manhattan's large and small, and consider, of course, the supersonic, supersonic transport, which can reduce these to a sea of shattered glass. Um, you wish to find the countryside? You must leave the city to do so. 
But in order uh, to find the countryside, you must follow the paths of this, those who did before you, and in so doing, you will transect the annular rings of the disillusioned who are encapsulated within the, the body of the city. But if you get to the edge, you can recognize it because it has many emblems, the cadavers of great trees now dead, the muddy streams, the culverted streams, the sterilized topsoil, all the uh, special rural beauty obliterated to sustain these proud emblems of our society, the hot dog stand, the gas station, the diner, the billboards, the sagging wires, the split levels, the ranchers, the hot dog stands. Did I say it? I should say it twice. There are so many of them. Uh, why don't I have a cheery subject to talk about? It wasn't so when I was a boy. You see, I was born in Scotland. And the only problem then really was the the life inhibition that, was, that the great city constituted. The rest, of the, the rest of the countryside was protected by these great conservators, poverty and inaccessibility. But, <laughs> but in the intervening decades, there has been a great erosion, uh, not only in wild nature itself, but nature within the city, and perhaps most of all, in the nature of man. Well, uh, I have the, I'm now getting to my second story. Um, it's my own, actually, and uh, it derives from the sadness of my professional life, which involves looking at the, uh, the backsides of society's emblems. Um, this story involves the atomic holocaust. There's some sepulchral warrior, some great, brave, white-coated warrior, some white-coated non-combatant will press some buttons and there will be an atomic cataclysm uh, in order to resolve some human squabbles, the result of which will be the extirpation of, if not all life, much of life. And we'll assume in my little, for my, the purpose of my little story that all life has been extinguished, save in one deep leaden slit where long inured to radiation persists a small colony of algae, these little microscopic unicellular plants. And the algae conclude that all life has been extinguished save they, and uh, they realize that two and a half billion years of life uh, have gone, and that perhaps two and a half billion years of time must elapse, and all the competition and cooperation and adaptation, uh, and evolution, of course, to rediscover yesterday. Two and a half billion years to rediscover yesterday. And they come to an immediate, spontaneous, and unanimous conclusion. Next time, no brains. I really don't think it's to be laughed at at all. I think that the brains really are on test. Uh, the, the, the question is, are brains, in fact, the apex of biological evolution, or is the brain simply a spinal tumor? Uh, who knows? But if the alga laughs last, we will not be there to hear. A very small, sad little laugh it will be, too. The brain is in trial. And uh, I think one has got to then ask about the values of these people you see who so vaunt brains and who do represent the greatest threat uh, to survival of all life, uh, quite apart from all men. And uh, so we'll now talk very, very briefly, uh, uh, stealing some of the thunder of the theologian who will speak tonight, about these values. And it will become very clear to you that I'm a Presbyterian, or rather a lapsed Presbyterian, uh, as you know, people born in, children born in Scotland are almost inevitably Presbyterians, and uh, this is a sort of stigmata which is pressed upon the baby's buttocks as, as it is raised up. We don't spank them, they would just put a brand on. Uh, it says Presbyterian. And, uh, you know, if it's nice, it's sinful, uh, fundamentally, is a, the subtitle of the brand. However, um, People like me can never escape theological questions, and uh, I think the problem we're involved in has the theological implications, which I'll at least give some openings to so that the uh, theologian tonight can uh, either destroy me or elaborate. It seems to me that uh, we're really concerned with uh, men, brain men, who believe that uh, man is justified by brain, that everything above the navel really is pro-brain and noble and manly, and everything below the navel, or the throat for that matter, is sort of camel bestial and anti-godly. 
And we have made brain, in fact, the symbol of man, and we have set up an opposition between man and nature, which is to say brain and the natural path of man. And we're involved in a profound dichotomy, and, and, and of course, conquest is a resolution of it, that man shall conquer nature, and brain will be the object, the, or the attribute of man, which she shall use in this conquest. Anyway, we don't have to speculate about it because we have a very good text, and I think it's, it's uh, very, very clear in the first chapter of Genesis. Uh, that is the, uh, the creation story, which tells us what man's relationship is to nature. And it says very simply, and I will paraphrase, it makes no difference, that man is exclusively divine, which is to say everything else is rubbish or non-divine. The world consists of a dialogue between man and God. Nothing else can talk to God. Uh, next, that man is given dominion over all life and non-life. Dominion, you know, no kidding, no negotiation. Dominion is very, very simple. And man is finally enjoined to subdue the earth. And there it is. I think there's no more cata catastrophic text ever been written in any religion. If ever there was a license to the bulldozer mentality, to the sepulchral war warriors who will uh, induce the atomic holocaust, to those people who will destroy the earth, singing peans of self-praise, there is that text. And I would very, very greatly welcome the theologian tonight telling us that this is an allegory, or even better, a myth. It's bad news, whatever he calls it. Um, of course, this thing was transposed from Judaism into Christianity without much change. And uh, we, uh, Christianity, added uh, some other refinements here, which just made it a little worse. Uh, principally, otherworldliness. The medieval Christian view was, that, of course, that... Uh, Life on earth was a probation for the life hereafter, and the acts of man to nature were really inconsequential. Man was engaged in a dialogue, dialogue with God. Man's acts on earth were only consequential in terms of his salvation and life in another world. And this other worldliness, of course, uh, uh, gave little consequence to the acts of man and nature, uh, which I think is rather, uh, 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 well, stupid statement I was going to make. It doesn't make any difference. Scratch it. Otherworldliness is characteristic of medieval uh, uh, Christianity, and I think uh, persists within us. The Renaissance didn't do much much better with it. I think it, it accepted all of the uh, the implicit sense of man's divinity, dominion, and subjugation, but uh, his powers increased during the Renaissance, like a great bag of helium being pumped up. This enormous inflation of man's ego, uh, which was accompanied, of course, by increasingly greater powers to destroy. I have found it very, very interesting to see the evolution of this view, this great uh, combined uh, ego inflation and uh, enlargement of a cultural inferiority revealed in aggression. Uh, one, uh, one could use the garden as a marvelous metaphysical symbol. If you start off with the cloister, <clears throat> medieval cloister, you see uh, that nature within the cloister, of course, is a, a little, um, how can one put it? It's like cookie cutters. You know these little things that you, you press on the dough and you make little shapes? You know these things? Yeah, everyone knows. All right. It's that view of nature. You take nature and you say, lie down. And then you arrange it in pretty little pat patterns. You say, we want some benign, tractable plants. And we'll put them in a simple Euclidean geometry. And we'll survey this thing as evidence of man's capacity to dominate the world and to subjugate it. And of course, in a cloister, it's really uh, it doesn't matter very much at all. It's simply a ridiculous little pattern and, and irrelevant. But when you see the same conception grow up uh, in the Renaissance, in the Villa Medici and Lanti and, uh, and uh, Desti, and then later on in uh, Aldebrandini and Mondragoni, you suddenly begin to see that the people who are about to, be, to colonize the ends of the earth and to open up this continent really do believe, you see, that man's role is to conquer nature, that man is exclusively divine, and uh, uh, subjugation and conquest are his creed. Uh, and of course, when this conception moves to France, then we have the final idiocy of Versailles. I don't know if any of you have been to Versailles. Versailles is just a little garden in which the main axis is one and a half miles long, and the cross axis is a half a mile long. And the construction of this thing took half the treasury of France during the entire life of Louis XIV. And it is a metaphysical symbol of enormous importance, because all the most benign and tractable plants that could be assembled are laid down in the greatest cookie-cutting geometry you ever saw in your life. And Louis XIV laid the twin axes of Versailles, you see, king by divine right, the, the sun king, uh, the roi soleil, 
And uh, he uh, was, in fact, transected by these twin axes, you see, and all nature lay down before him, or so he thought. But nonetheless, this was a view of man and nature, that nature was something to be uh, dominated, to be subjugated, and the great art of the Renaissance, uh, particularly Le Notre at Versailles, was used to demonstrate this metaphysical symbol. And we have not relinquished it, because it is our own. It is the ragbag of our own inheritance, the illusion of exclusive divinity, uh, the uh, license to, uh, to dominate the world and to subjugate it. Uh, there was a, no, I would say to, yes, one of my better phrases, Mr. President, I would say to people who, uh, who have this view, it is not really necessary to destroy nature in order to get God's favor or even his undivided attention. That's a good line, isn't it? There we go. I stopped being frightened, which is probably bad. The speech will now falter. <laughs> I am, of course, by profession a landscape architect. Now, landscape architect is a way in any society in which you can wear a, a hair shirt permanently. Um, but there was one time when landscape architects were rather important and really remarkably useful. I think they are today, but they're a small beleaguered few, sort of aberrants in the Western tradition. The 18th century is an area as a period not very well, very well known, um, uh, and it's worthwhile spending two or three minutes talking about it because I think the, uh, the precursory movement, which we must know, there was a precursory movement of another value system in the Western tradition which uh, we can turn to as a, a, a new beginning for ourselves. It may not be no, and of course I'm speaking. I'm going to speak about England. You have to realize my objectivity that uh, there's no subject about which I can speak with more objectivity than England, being a Scotsman. Uh, England in the, 18th, the beginning of the 18th century was a rattled land, the most impoverished country in Europe, with the most backward agriculture. Um, What's it called? Uh, Evelyn had written a book uh, deploring the fact that the, it was impossible in the whole country to get any oaks to build ships. And of course, at that time, they started deforesting Scotland in order to get them. And they started deforesting the eastern part of the United States, too. We, are both, we both suffered from this uh, foreign invasion. Um, anyway, here was this rattled countryside, impoverished medieval architecture in which a man might inherit one furrow in one, uh, one farm and another furrow somewhere else. Um, this was uh, the background for the 18th century revolution. Uh, the English had a normal antagonism for France. Uh, Versailles was just being completed. At that, at that time, there were a number of writers uh, who suddenly decided that in rather than nature being vile and crude and carnal and bestial, which had to be subjugated by godly man, had to be put into cookie cutter Euclidean geometries in order to be saved, uh, that nature itself, wild nature, was indeed beautiful and sublime and might, in fact, even evoke spiritual experiences. And moreover, there could be a harmony with man and nature. So Thompson, Cowley, Dyer, Hamilton, Addison, Lord Shaf uh, Earl of Shaftesbury, Bur Burlingham, lots more of them, suddenly started an enormous effusion on the subject of a prospective harmony of man and nature. Uh, coincident with this, there were a number of painters, if you remember, uh, all English young men who were educated at that time had to make the Grand Tour, had to go to Europe, and they uh, came under the influence of the Campania, saw the Campania, the Roman Campania, and they also knew of the paintings of Salvador Rosa, Claude Lorraine, and Poussin, and they concluded that the form of this ideal nature was represented by the nature in these paintings. Moreover, at this time, two men, Sir William Temple and who was the other one, doesn't matter, two Orientalists, came and uh, received letters uh, secondhand from Jesuits who had uh, uh, gone to China. And from this, they learned that there was a new kind of composition. There was something called an occult balance, that in order to compose, you didn't have to have equal things on either side of an axis. But there was another way of weighing elements in a composition which had a harmony. So these things, the conception of, uh, oh yes, I've forgotten the other one. The other one was the determination to re-enclose the land and to introduce the modern agriculture which had developed in Germany. So all these things came together. 
And then through, the, through first of all, the Earl of Burlingham and uh, the writer Pope, uh, and through the instrument of uh, William Kent, I think the first real, real landscape architect uh, in this Western tradition, the modern tradition, they start to remake over a whole landscape. And I think it is not widely known that uh, William Kent, uh, William Shenstone, uh, Sir Humphrey Repton, Repton, Capability Brown, Ubedale Price, Payne Knight, a small handful of landscape architects, determined the pattern of na the patterns of uh, unity of man and nature for England in the 18th century, which was widely copied by landowners throughout the entire countryside, as a result of which the landscape you see in England today as natural landscape you will find is entirely an artifice accomplished by these very, very few men. These were men who found the land in poor heart, the land poor, and the land ugly, and who made this fair, prosperous, rich, and beautiful land which is still visible today. And it was based upon a prop proposition that the land, that the, 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 the man, the artist, man, the doctor, man, the precursor ecologist, could understand the land and work with it to make a harmony of man and nature and make this indeed visibly so. Hmm. However, it's terribly sad to observe that this great naturalism, uh, which transformed the continent, the greatest act of art accomplished in the entire Western tradition, the greatest land rehabilitation accomplished in the Western tradition, uh, that this was not sufficient to withstand the onslaught of the Industrial Revolution, so that if Lee Sows and, uh, and uh, Marlborough are the metaphysical symbols for the 18th century in England, the 19th century, the dark satanic mills of Bradford and Sheffield, the precursors of Pittsburgh's and so on, are the better the metaphysical symbols for the 19th century. And the 20th century is only the 19th century with more power, with, a great, with the same instinct to conquer, but uh, inordinately greater powers to accomplish this conquest. And I think we have to recognize that out of it, we have a creed, and the creed can best be called economic determinism. And if this is understood, then uh, we can see that it isn't a paradox at all that a slum is considered a very, very sound, a sound uh, uh, investment, or that the most loathsome roadside stand is more valuable than the richest farmland, or even that redwoods uh, these priceless, irreplaceable redwoods are considered more useful in the form of grape steaks or tomato steaks. But I think we've got to recognize that the economic model is a very inadequate view of the world. Uh, it is extremely useful for the purchase of toilet paper, shoe polish, uh, toothpaste, soap, things of this sort, enormously useful. But I think one has got to recognize that the economic model has two simple deficiencies. The first of these is that it excludes every single human aspiration of any importance. It has no place for health, beauty, delight, compassion, or justice. These cannot exist. These are non-price benefits and cannot be included in the economic model. And so it inexor inexorably proceeds to its own self-fulfillment, which is greater philistinism, greater despoliation. Uh, the other uh, simple uh, deficiency of the economic model is that, of course, it excludes the entire biophysical world. It has no place for the sun, the moon, the stars, the inclined axis of the earth, the seasons, the uh, decomposers, the plants, the animals, or even that greatest uh, value of all, that with which we confront the, the future, uh, the genetic pool. Well. If this is so, I'm sorry you're becoming a little torpid. This is very, very bad. Why shouldn't you become torpid? It's a melancholy subject, and I really can hardly make it uh, too entertaining. But there is a way. Written on the wall is not many, many take a lot harson, but written on the wall is ecology, 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 the truth. And so giving something else to the theologian to... Uh, dispute or destroy. I'll now proceed to my third story. Once upon a time, I was terribly poor. I'm not exactly wealthy now, but when I came to University of Pennsylvania from Scotland, lured by uh, the promise of inordinate wealth, I arrived to become a prospective chairman of the Department of Landscape Architecture. 
uh, with a vision of immediately buying a Rolls Royce because I was about to receive the salary of $5,000 a year. <laughs> At that time, I was, as I say, uh, not wealthy. And there's a famous architect in Philadelphia called Lou Kahn, I think the resident genius in architecture in the United States today. And he wasn't wealthy either. As a matter of fact, he was poorer than I was. He didn't have an overcoat. I had an overcoat, which had been made in 1945. Uh, he didn't have an overcoat at all. However, both of us were given a job. Uh, Rias, the research arm of Glenn L. Martin, wanted to build a temple of science for which they had to find a, an Elysian 250-acre site somewhere upon which they would put a building appropriate to the view of themselves. So they hired me to search up and down the eastern seaboard of the United States to find the appropriate Elysian site of 250 acres, and he asked Lou Kahn to uh, design the building. Uh, the only trouble is we took quite a long time to uh, find the site. Uh, Elysian sites are indeed hard to find. And <clears throat> uh, I, don't, I don't think it was hindered. Our search was not accelerated by the fact that we were being paid so well and looked after so well during the search. During this time, Lou Kahn, who had no other work to do, was designing a bathhouse, a Jewish bathhouse in Camden. It was his only commission, except to say that they were not paying him. But nonetheless, this cinder block uh, uh, work of art was consuming most of his time. But the remaining time, he decided to design the building. So that by the time we had found the site, the site didn't fit the building. And uh, by and large, it was not a great product from this experience, save one. We met a very important German scientist who was employed by Glenn L. Martin, a sort of biological equivalent to Werner von Braun. And uh, this fellow uh, uh, was engaged in an experiment to try and design a, uh, no, he was trying to design an experiment to send a man off to the moon with the least possible luggage. And uh, this is a number of years ago. And of course, uh, it had to be a recirculating uh, system, which is to say a biological system. And uh, the little experiment he was, going, he was working on was as follows. He had a plywood capsule, and a plywood capsule simulated a capsule. And in the capsule was a fluorescent tube, and the fluorescent tube was simulating the sun. But then, of course, electricity is only fossil sunlight anyway. And in the plywood capsule was some air, some water, some algae, our old friend, he who laughs last algae, and a man. And uh, the experiment worked for all of 24 hours, which is a marvelous testament to our understanding of nature. <laughs> they, uh, they'll get it to work longer. Huh? Anyway, the system worked as follows. Uh, the sunlight, of course, fueled the system. The, the world really consists of a dialogue, as you know, between the sun and the plant, uh, which, uh, uh, and man sort of sits uh, independently, benignly smiling, secure of his own superiority, unknowing of this uh, other dialogue. However, in the little capsule, the system is fueled by the uh, sunlight falling upon the, upon the algae. In, in the man's terms, the man simply breathes in some air, consumes oxygen, breathes out carbon dioxide, which the algae inhales. Uh, the algae uh, e e expels oxygen, which the man breathes, and so there's a close cycle of oxygen and carbon dioxide. The man gets thirsty, he drinks some water, he urinates, the water goes into the uh, the uh, solution in which the algae lives, uh, the algae transpires, the transpirations are condensed, the man drinks the condensation, there's a closed cycle of water. The man gets hungry, eats some algae, and don't laugh. With six billion people on Earth, most of us will be eating algae, and indeed the swimming pool may be the major element of agricultural production. So uh, the man eats some algae, and he masticates, digests, defecates. And of course, there are decomposer algae, and the decomposer algae reconstitute the waste into forms which are utilizable by the other algae, or all algae, which then grow, which the man eats, and so there's a close cycle of food. And in this little system, we have single input, which is sunlight, and we have a single output, which is heat. And the, uh, the, uh, oh, there is a closed cycle of oxygen, carbon dioxide, a closed cycle of water, and a closed cycle of food. And the question is, is that the way the world works? And the answer is, you're damn right, that's the way the world works. And the person who's been in this capsule metaphorically or literally and understands it is an emancipated man, and all the rest are pre-Copernican. And this is the real division. Those who have been in the capsule uh, metaphorically or literally are indeed emancipated men. They, are, they cannot be planetary diseases because they know that the infliction of lesions upon the world life body is self-mutilation. And the people who have not been in the capsule, metaphorically or literally, are indeed planetary diseases.
And this is a fundamental and absolute division. So the man who has been in the capsule can, can have some type of reflection. He could reflect, for instance, that probability suggests that if the man, there has to be an equal biomass of man and of algae. So if the man and the algae stay there long enough, all that had been algae will be man all at a certain instant in time. All that had been algae would be man. All that had been man would be algae. And for those of us with a theological uh, bent, we can ask uh, if you know man was exclusively divine, who is divine at this particular point? And I suggest to you that uh, there is a you know that there is a reasonable proposition to say the halo on the algae looks just as ridiculous as the halo on a man. <laughs> if one is divine, all is divine. If none are divine, none are divine. What else can one make of this thing? Oh, I think you can make a lot of things out of that little experiment. Uh, I would say the man who stayed there long enough might devise a little prayer, a little pantheist prayer. He would have discovered how the world worked. And he would uh, say, uh, sun, I mean, he's only speaking to a fluorescent tube, but as, as I say, fossil sunlight. He would say, sun, shine that we may live. Not in any arrogant way, but a very deferential way indeed. Sun, shine that we may live. And then we say, ocean, ancient home, from which we have only now escaped by the length of a cell, because the blood in man is very, very similar chemically to the primeval seas whence escaped that first amphibian. He would say, ocean, ancient home. And he would look to the clouds and the rivers and streams and say, replenish us from the sea that we may live. And he would look to the atmosphere and say, atmosphere, some of the ancient breaths of all life's past replenish us. And he would look to the plant, any plant, touch any plant, sense every plant, and say, be and live and breathe and grow that we may breathe and eat and live. And he'd pick up some saw in his hands and know that there therein are these essential decomposers named by these people who had no sense of the honor they deserve as Zotobacter and Nostoc and the rest, the return stroke in the cycle of matter in the universe, these unknown, unnamed heroes, essential for all life processes. And he would say to these decomposers, where does, I, where does it say it? Ah, yes. Reconstitute the waste of life and the stuff of life after death so that life may endure. And when he has said that, when he, when he and we know these things and say these things, we have left this simple world of innocence, of ignorance, and we've ab we can abandon our ancient cultural inferiority complex, which insists upon aggressive acts towards nature. We can abandon conquest as our motive, and we can begin to think of man in nature some catalytic enzyme who uh, manages to manage or nurture the biosphere. All right, we draw another little line, and it's 20 past, so we have 20 minutes more, right? I wish somebody could take this thing, you see, and really uh, uh, make a prayer of it. I have a friend called Howard Nemiroff, who's a great poet. If you don't know him, you should. And I dearly love him to take hold of this thing and make a prayer of it. I think we really do need a pantheist prayer. I don't think it's an anti-Christian prayer or an anti-Jewish prayer. It is only the modern view. It is only a, you know, it's only a view of the world as the world is, instead of the ignorance, you see, which is represented in the creation story, this horrifying text which fuels uh, conquest and dominion. We really need to have a view of the world as the working world and a place of man in it. And we need a prayer for this. It's not enough that, that it repose in science. There are too few ecologists and they're such modest men uh, that their views don't permeate the world. And this, this needs to move from science and move into literature, into life, and permeate all of our views. And so it then should be incorporated, you see, into, into music and into literature, into painting and into poetry. Who will paint a painting of algae, you see? Who will paint a painting of decomposers? Far more important than things that people paint. Who will write a poem about neg entropy, you see? Gracious me, this is our creativity. Nobody writes poems about neg entropy. All right. We're going into the stretch, friends. Uh, yeah. 
I, of course, am not an ecologist. I'm a landscape architect and a regional planner. I do some city planning. I may be called a quasi-crypto-pseudo-ecologist. <laughs> that is, I have recognized what I am. Uh, I know that, that, that my subjective, in whatever they are, you know, uh, my intuition takes me where I go and I use my reason to justify how I got there. And uh, my view about evidence is that I have some sort of attitudes towards uh, life and love and justice and compassion and beauty and so on, which I derive where I kn know not. And I'll use anybody's ev evidence to justify the position I took in the first place. So as you can see, I really cannot claim to be a scientist or an ecologist. But nonetheless, I find their arguments very persuasive to support the position that I somehow uh, learned in boyhood. Uh, so uh, I'm not, you see, really an honest uh, scientist. And if you want honest science, you've got to go to someone else. But I'll tell you what I've derived from ecology and uh, how important it is to me as a positive contribution. You see, th this little thing has gone through three steps. The first is we've got to use a Presbyterian device of frightening the audience, and which, if you aren't frightened, you should be, you see. And the second is that we have got to offer a, just a sort of hint of salvation, which is the man-algae story. Go through this, and you have some sort of sense of the way the world works, so that your little incremental acts, in fact, can positively be creative. You're not, indeed, an agent of planetary disease. You may, in fact, add some little incremental creative thing to, uh, to add to the world's yearning. Uh, but this is only, you see, a caricature. One needs to have more than this. One needs a larger model. And I think the physical sciences, biological sciences, integrated through ecology have a model. And this is harder to talk about because it requires knowledge and skills that, of which I have very, very little. But that has never deterred me from talking about it. Uh, I think the first thing is that there, there is, a, there is a, a real view of creation and destruction. Uh, I teach in the School of Fine Arts, and the School of Fine Arts houses architects, landscape architects, uh, city and regional planners, painters, and sculptors. And by and large, the view of creation that's held therein is that in order to be creative, what you do is you stop washing, uh, let your hair grow as long as possible, wear sandals, eccentric dress, and then you wait for God to touch you in the shoulder. And uh, <laughs> I have nothing against this device. Anybody who can make it work, I congratulate, but I suggest there has to be another uh, method to be employed during the long waiting periods. <laughs> so, creation and destruction is true, and I think we've got to learn what creation is and so that we can act in a creative way. Uh, the, uh, oh, how can one do this? If you compare the early world, the coalescing gases sometimes six billion years ago with the present world, there obviously has been a change as, as between these two situations. The physicists and the biologists tell us that the, that the creative process went from greater to lesser randomness, from simple to complex, from uniform to diverse, from a low to a high number of species, oh, from instability to stability, from a low to a high number of species, from a low to a high number of symbioses, indeed from entropy to neg entropy. All right. So the, the, we know that creativity is true. Creativity consists of the employment of energy with matter to raise matter to higher levels of order. And destruction consists of the regression of matter uh, to lower levels of order. Boom. And this is true whether we're talking about physical processes, life processes, uh, social or cultural processes. Presumably, there is creativity will exhibit these attributes. And the difference we can see between the early Earth, the coalescing grasses, and the present uh, planet covered with myriads of life, with myriads of uh, organisms engaged in myriads of symbiotic relationships composing the biosphere, the superorganism that is the biosphere, this little layer of life that encompasses the entire Earth. Boom. Within this, it is believed that there are three major processes which are uh, fundamental. Uh, the first one is neg entropy itself, and that is, that is uh, the creative increase in the levels of order of matter, either in physical processes or in life systems. And in all of, there is, of course, a great deal of this done in physical processes, but I think it's most important to, to recognize that the plant really is a basis of the creative process that is the earth. Uh, it is a little plant of the chloroplast in a plant which holds its leaves up to the sunlight and says, uh, sun, may I have some, in your, some of your energy on its path to degradation? 
I will give it back to you, but may I have it temporarily. And the sun ascends. And so in the presence of water and carbon dioxide, the chloroplast holds its little hands up to the sun and encapsulates some, some of the sun into its being and arrests it temporarily because it has to lose it. It is a radiating light, a radiating heat. But during this temporary period, during which it holds this sunlight within itself, uh, it orders that matter into its being. And as the sunlight is constantly replaced, this encapsulation of temporarily entrapped sunlight is the basis for all the orderings accomplished by all plants and all animals and all men and all life and in all time. And this then is a fundamental creative act which is accomplished on the earth and it is accomplished by the plant. I'll say that again. All life, <laughs> all plants, all animals, uh, will, I'm sure there's some very, very good scientists here who will tell me it's not true for sulfur bacteria and for iron bacteria. But with the, the exception of these, all life in all time is dependent upon the dialogue between the sun and the plant in which the plant temporarily entraps sunlight on its path to entropy and encapsulates it into its being from which then derive all the orderings accomplished by all life and all time and all men. Boom. That's neg entropy. That is creativity. So as we look at the plant, don't consider a plant beautiful. I don't care if they're beautiful or not. And it's important to recognize that the man in the algae, you know, the man in the algae experiment, I don't know whether he, if he went off to the moon with the algae, would think they were beautiful or not. But who cares? He would know they're indispensable. And this is a far, far better proposition. I know perfectly well I cannot defend any area of natural beauty because it is beautiful. Can you see me going before the Bureau of Public Roads, these greatest institutionalized barbarians and Philistine, Philistines in the United States, <laughs> who've got $4 billion now to go in uh, and, and build scenic highways? I give some evidence to Lawrence Rockefeller. This is a little parenthesis, but it doesn't matter. If I lose the beginning of the sentence, you don't care. I gave some evidence before Lawrence Rockefeller's committee on, what's it called, Presidential Committee on Natural Beauty and Recreation and Natural Beauty. They asked my advice on what they should do with the $4 billion of, uh, for scenic highways. I said, the first thing is to hide all areas called scenic from highway engineers. <laughs> the second thing to do is not allow a highway engineer or a highway commission into a scenic area, even as a civilian. However, you can recognize very well you can't, you can't uh, defend an area of natural beauty from barbarians because it's beautiful. But you might just be able to defend it on the grounds of its being indispensable. You see, even the stupidest Philistine in the capsule would not destroy, destroy the algae because he would know, the thick-headed brute, he would know, you see, that this was indispensable for his own survival. And this, I suggest, is a much, much better attitude to plants than they are beautiful. They are not beautiful. They're indispensable. And they may also be beautiful, but the beauty is a bonus. Uh, where are we? Neg entropy. All right, we've done that. The next thing uh, which seems to be important is that en the energy you see which falls upon a body can either be energy or it can be construed as information, right? If I sit beside a rock, the assumption is that the sunlight that falls upon the rock does not inform the rock as being heated. The rock is heated. The rock expands. If the sunlight falls upon me, I'm informed I'm heated, and I take, uh, I reconstitute this energy as information, and the information is meaning, and I respond to this. And this, I think, we can describe as apperception. I respond by getting a beer, taking off my shirt, uh, a number of things. All right, so we can think now of uh, energy, first of all, being used by the plant uh, to create, to raise matter to higher levels of order. This is then neg entropy. But the, the capacity to be able to take energy and transmute it into information, transmute that into meaning and respond to it, apperception, is also latently negentropy. It is latently creative. The information, construed as meaning, has the power then to, uh, to initiate a creative act, either by a plant, an animal, a microorganism, doesn't matter what it is. And so we've got to recognize that apperception then is intrinsic to this creative process. Perhaps more important than all of this is uh, symbiosis. I don't know if the word is familiar to you. I only knew about it three or four years ago. As a matter of fact, all the things I'm talking about, I didn't know at all five years ago. Terrible thing to you know, start learning the, the commonplaces of natural science at the age of 43. It's really you know, it's a, some sort of statement in education, uh, Mr. President. And I, it's not as if I went to bad places. It wasn't the best, but I went to Harvard for four years. <coughs> Four, year, four graduate years of social science is not a bit of natural science. Excruciating. 
and isn't a lot better now. However, things have improved at the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> I may not be as good as I should be, but I'm not modest. Terrible. <laughs> Uh, nothing worse than a recent convert. The next thing is symbiosis. Harold Bloom has written a marvelous book called uh, Entropy and Evolution, and he describes symbiosis as time's arrow and evolution. Well, what are symbiosis? These are simply cooperative mechanisms. Uh, and perhaps these, this can be most easily described uh, with a, an image uh, developed by Hans Selye, the great physiologist at the University of Montreal. Selye says, you and I consist of about 30 billion billion cells. Every one of these cells starts, starts off as a single uh, generalized cell. And uh, yet, in the evolution from a single fertilized egg up to the totally integrated, relatively, organism of 30 billion billion cells, uh, every one of these cells, which starts as a generalized cell, has to make some specialization in order to assume a role, a development of organs and tissues and so on. Uh, so every one of them then is conceding some part of its own autonomy in the assumption of a specialist role and in the assumption then of cooperative mechanisms. As if, you know, uh, some cells said, well, uh, look, uh, I'll be, uh, I'll be blood tissue, I'll be white blood cells, I'll be red blood cells, I'll be pancreas, I'll be spleen, I'll be heart, I'll be kidney, you know, there they are. Somehow this, we can hear the dialogue and thank God we don't have to, uh, to organize it. But this sort of thing is going on and these 30 billion billion cells manage to organize themselves in such a way as they fill all the roles that have to, have to be filled. And in the evolution from single generalized cells to specialist cells, they have conceded some part of their own autonomy, you see. And they have engaged in cooperative mechanisms because the heart depends on the kidneys, which depend on the spleen, which depend upon the white blood cells, the red blood cells, and so on. And so there are myriads of, of uh, symbiotic relationships which have to exist in order for these 30 billion billion cells to, to exist as a single integrated organism. Now, a little parenthesis about that. Uh, for instance, any, uh, somebody could take and take, uh, uh, some doctor could come now and take some, ungeneral, some generalized cells out of our marrow now. And we can imagine a little dialogue involving my cells. Supposing somebody, uh, a doctor came uh, and said, uh, McCarr, do you mind if we take some generalized cells out of your marrow? I said, no. And uh, the uh, doctor says to the cells, what do you think? The cells say, gee, you know, I'd be very glad, but you've got to make me a promise. And the doctor said, I'll make you a promise. He says, uh, well, you've got to put me in a petri glass, and you've got to put me in a culture, and you've got to keep me the right temperature and humidity. And the doctor says, fine. And the cells say, great. I'm immortal, and it's absolutely true. You see, the, uh, the, the uh, simple cells, unicellular plants and animals, are to all intents and purposes immortal. There is a sort of wave of life. They leave behind some old tissue and so on, but there is a continuous wave of life. But of course, I'm not immortal. You can hear the cells saying it. I've been with McCarg a few years, they say, and this chap, he smokes, he drinks, stays up at night, he's obsessive. If ever I saw a mortal mortal, there is a mortal mortal. And, <laughs> Let's get out of here, you know. <laughs> Immortality is better. And so it's terribly important to recognize this because the evolution from a single cell to the 30 billion billion cells replicates, of course, the whole of evolution from unicellular organisms to multicell uh, organisms. And there is a concession then, you see, along the way, both in the case of the fertilized egg that became you and me, or the case of the unicellular plant or, or animal which started off at the beginning of evolution, which, by the way, is not superseded, but only augmented, that uh, this evolution uh, involved, in every case, cooperative mechanisms. And so it is appropriate to say that this is the arrow of evolution. The, these are essential. Now, we can, uh, we can go a little step further, as Selye did. Selye said, <clears throat> these cells are really engaged in cooperative mechanisms, as if to say, I'll do this if you do that, you see. Uh, and this is, in fact, uh, altruism. That is, each of these cells somehow freely, because this was done in evolution, you see, freely has conceded some part of its autonomy towards an enterprise which, engages, which involves cooperation for survival or for improvement or fulfillment. We know not what. Uh, so it's terribly important to recognize that this altruism, which is now stepping out of the bounds of science into the bounds of ethics and philosophy, that altruism seems to be absolutely central to, to biology and to life. 
And altruism, of course, is only a rather uh, dry word for love. <laughs> uh, that's very nice, you know, isn't it? I hope the theologian will deal with this, the biological basis for love. Which allows me now to come to uh, my conclusion. There are, two, there are two other little criteria which get me into the workman's world I really live in. Supposing you said, all right, creativity is true and de destruction is true, McCarg, and if we had physicists who were clever enough and wanted to spend enough time, they could find out how much creativity had been accomplished uh, of all the sun's light that had fallen upon the earth since the beginning of time, uh, how much creativity had been accomplished by physical process and life forms since the beginning of time to today. See? And we have a, then a gross national creativity, gross uh, terrestrial, gross, gross global creativity, we'll call it, right. There it is. This is our accounting. And it will be destructive processes which are going to reduce this, and it will be creative processes which are added. And we can have a little accounting, you see, hopefully, at least sustaining the creativity of the world. Uh, now, let's see. But we'd like to have some kind of criterion which could, could, could assess this. It's very difficult to work out systems in terms of entropy units. Very, very difficult indeed. But we have, you see, we really have a, a device given to us by two great men, one of whom was great and was honored, Darwin, and the other who was great and was not honored, called Lawrence J. Henderson, who never made any better an associate professor at Harvard, but wrote a great book called The Fitness of the Environment. Henderson said, the world is fit for life, the attributes of oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, etc., 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 water, the sea, are fit for life for all the forms of life that have existed, all the forms of life that do exist, all forms of life that will exist. The world is fit for life, he said. Darwin said, the surviving organism is fit for the environment. And you just put the two of these together, you say, the world is fit for life, the surviving organism is fit for the environment. So we have a conception now of an, env an environment there will be an environment fit for every life form, past, present, and prospective. There will be an organism fit for every environment. There will be a process of fitting in which the organism tries to adapt the environment. No, the organism first tries to find the most propitious environment, adapts the environment to make it more fitting, adapts itself, both physiologically, through mutation over time, and in the case of higher animals, through symbiotic mechanisms, in the case of man, through devices like planning and art and government and politics and religion and so on. All right, so we have a conception of searching for an environment, the most fitting environment, adapting the environment to make it more fit, adapting oneself to accomplish a better fit. So we have a conception of fitness and unfitness. There will therefore be an environment which is fit, which can be made more fitting, engaging things like architecture, landscape architecture, city and regional planning. These are only adaptive mechanisms in which we, the test is no different from the test which is applied to the chamber nautilus, the beehive, or the coral, or the barn swallow. You just exactly the same thing. Where is the propitious environment for that man or that land use? How can he make that environment more fitting? How can he adapt himself to accomplish a creative fit? And it's important to recognize that there will be an intrinsic fit and the, that there will be a form of the intrinsic fit. So we can move, we can say then, if you find an environment which is fit for an organism, you can find an organism fit for the environment, or a land use, fit for an environment, and you can see a process by which this can be made more fitting. And you will also be able to find an environment which is unfit for an organism, in which the organism cannot make the environment fit, in which the organism cannot adapt itself to accomplish a fitting. All right? Now, the first and important thing to, dis to recognize is that the process of finding an environment which is fit and making it more fitting either by adaptation of the environment or oneself, is in fact a creative process. It involves the, the, the employment of energy with matter and raising matter to higher levels of order. Right? That situation where one cannot find a fit environment and cannot adapt it to make it more fitting is either neutral or is destructive. That is, energies which can be used creatively are not being used creatively. So we have a conception of a creative fit and we have a conception of a destructive misfit. Now, I, because I care about form, I'll just interject a little bit about form. I, th I think it matters. Um, I think. Um, you could say as a proposition that form and process are indivisible aspects of a single phenomenon which is being. I'll say that again. Form and process are indivisible aspects of a single phenomenon which is being. That is, there is no thing which doesn't have form. There is no form which is not a thing. Form and process are indivisible. The thing is, in fact, revealed in form. The form, in fact, reveals the thing or the process. 
So that the, so this is the way to farm. Farm is not something in which you close your eyes and wait for God to touch you in the shoulder. Farm is because. In, understand, in order to understand the form of this place, one has got to invoke all historical, uh, physical and biological evolution, all physical, biological and cultural, cultural evolution, which reveals the place as process having intrinsic form, and moreover, having implications for a form, the, given, the made form that you will give. I can see this doesn't attract you. Well, form is a, form is a special kind of obsession, but it's a very, very important one. But supposing we just stop there and say we'd like another kind of synoptic measure which very simply subsumes creativity or destruction, uh, fitness or unfitness, and even form. And I say to you, we have one. If you want to have a test over billions of years which uh, asks, has the process been creative? Uh, has, it be, has it exhibited fitness and fitting? Or has it been destructive? Has it failed to exhibit fitness or fitting? We can use over the longest scale of some billions of years the question of evolutionary success. You say to the algae, are you successful? The algae says, man, I have two and a half billion years to show for it. I may have been augmented, but I have not been superseded. You say, great. And of course, the algae would say, what right do you have to ask you, you know, upstaff? Uh, but still, in absolute terms, the algae and the protozoans and the chordates and so on, all the simple plants and animals and bacteria and, and so on, they can say, success, sure. And then you move the scale down and you say, uh, we want a sort of measure for about a million years. And so this, the, the same kind of criterion with the time scale change might be survival. You say, uh, have a d dinosaur survived? They failed, you know. Have, uh, has a dodo survived? Too bad. Uh, has man survived? Yes, a million years. Got a million years. Not a great test, but not a bad test. And uh, you want to move this same thing down the time scale a little nearer. So what do you, you want? A criterion, the same kind of criterion, but using a time scale of, let's say, an instant, a month, a year. And of course, the same scale as health. The equivalent to evolutionary success, evolutionary survival, and the, the present is, of course, health. And the opposite of uh, evolutionary failure uh, is uh, pathology or death. So one then, and of course these, these, these things are all one thing. So one has a multifaceted unitary thing which exhibits creativity and fitness and health. And there's something else which is uh, destructiveness, ill-fitting, and pathology. And for me it is also important to realize that these have intrinsic form. So there will be a place See, uh, which reveals the intrinsic form of the creative, fit, healthy. And there will be a thing or a place or a process which exhibits uh, pathology, destructiveness. Uh, what's that one? Pathology, destructiveness, in the form of these. That's right. Ill fitting pathology, destructive pathology. Ah. So we can start the other way around now, you see. Those of us who want to diagnose and prescribe. First of all, find a place, any place, any process, mountain, lake, forest, stream, city, neighborhood, house, family, university, and ask, is it healthy? And this is not, of course, animal health. This is vitality. In the case of man, it means uh, a man who not only seeks and uh, solves problems, but so well, someone who seeks them. But if you find any process which exhibits health, then this is evidence of the creative fit and the form of the creative fit. If you find pathology, you have found a process in which the environment is unfit for the organism or the ecosystem. The ecosystem cannot adapt the environment in order to accomplish a creative fit, right? So this is, now we have a diagnostic tool. We can start with a world and see it as a biosphere which, with constituent ecosystems which exhibit degrees of health, degrees of fitness, which constitute value, which have intrinsic constraints, intrinsic opportunities for man who must manage these for health and for the creative fit, for his health, for his creative fitness, and his fulfillment. In this way, the ecological view of seeing the world as a bi biosphere made of ecosystems, exhibiting health and fitness and the form of these is in fact the ecological view. And that allows us then to see the place of man in nature and may po just possibly show us how man can be the catalytic enzyme who is indeed the husbandman who nurtures the earth. Thank you.